My name is uh, Simon Clark, uh, Projects Coordinator at the European Geosciences Union, and welcome to this webinar on fighting fake news, identifying and addressing scientific misinformation. This webinar will last one hour. We have time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. The webinar will itself will outline what, constituent, what constitutes misinformation, how it is generated, and how it spreads. Today's webinar will just be focusing on the topic of science policy using the recent example of the EU Commission's proposed nature restoration law. Uh, our guest speakers today are Hendrik Bruns, policy analyst at the European Commission Joint Research Centre, and Guy Pierre, ecologist and commentator on agricultural policy at the German Centre for Integrative Biodiversity Research and Helmholtz Centre for Environmental Research. So, uh, to begin, Hendrik, would you like to take it away? Okay, so um, my name is Hendrik Bruns. I'm working for the European Commission Joint Research Centre, and there specifically in the Behavioural Insights team, which is called here the Competence Centre on Behavioural Insights. So my background is not in natural sciences, not in geosciences, although I have a bachelor degree in geography and economics, but in my academic career, I then switched to environmental economics and behavioural economics. And we recently um, made a, had a project on misinformation and how to best pre-bunk and debunk misinformation um, being in the European Commission. And I want to give a brief outline of this project and before that providing some like a brief introduce introduction to the behavioral aspects of misinformation, disinformation. So for the sake of this, um, talk, we will think about misinformation as um, incorrect information that is shared by people on online or offline um, without knowing, without a specific intention of deceiving someone. Whereas when we normally talk about disinformation, especially um, being the focus of most of the policies and regulations of the European Commission, um, talking about um, intentionally shared misinformation in order to deceive people or in order to um, reach certain goals. So this is normally understood as disinformation. Um, what I want to focus on, or what I normally uh, normally build these talks is that we start at the roots, at the psychological roots of misinformation. Why do people share misinformation? Why do people believe in misinformation? Here's symbolized by the, the roots of the tree. Um, to the right then, what are the consequences of misinformation? So if the, if the tree is growing, what are the consequences, which can often be dire, especially when we are talking, for example, about health-related misinformation, but also in terms of misinformation related to um, climate change, for example, they got negative consequences in terms of um, the policies people support, for example. Then how can we, um, or specific institutions, or um, the European Commission in particular, how can we um, fight misinformation? And then on the outer right hand side, how can we build a society that is resilient against misinformation? This being one of the very explicit goals of the European Commission um, to build European citizens resilience against misinformation. So to enable them to fight misinformation, to spot misinformation themselves. Um, for the sake of time, I will be mostly um, or exclusively concentrate on the roots, on the psychological foundations, and also on ways to fight misinformation because this was the focus of the projects that I want to introduce to you. So starting with the roots. Um, many of you might know that actually psychology has a quite um, developed literature on conspiracy theories and what the psychological con um, roots of, of conspiracy theories are. On the right hand side, you see a nice popular psychology books by Rob Brotherton um, that I can recommend that is provides quite a nice, nice um, introduction to the psychological foundations of um, people's belief in, uh, in, in conspiracy theories. And conspiracy theories are here defined as um, attempts to explain the ultimate causes of significant social and political events and circumstances with claims of secret plots by two or more powerful and malevolent actors. And the three words here highlighted um, are actually explaining or are hinting towards um, three main psychological reasons or causal underpinnings of people's beliefs in conspiracy theories. Um, as humans, we are prone to look for patterns in, in things that are happening 
and this is related to cognitive and epistemic factors. So how we arrive at the truth, how we use our brains in order to deduce if something is true or not. So we are looking for patterns. We're looking for a system, something that can explain certain events. We are also very, very prone to monitoring social factors. So this is relating to the powerful. We are very sensitive to, to power hierarchies, um, to the social networks in which we, um, in which we are um, acting. For example, to the extent that people who are in, um, in a less powerful situation, a less powerful social situation, are tending to be more receptive or more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. And um, in relation to the aspect of malevolent actors here, um, based on our, on our, um, on how we, on how humans developed, we are prone to, um, are very, very receptive to uncertain environments. So when something is happening, when something is seen as being potentially threatening to our, to ourselves, this can trigger very, very, um, um, very, very um, intuitive behavior in order to resist in order to protect yourself against these factors. And this is also one reason why people, for example, in, in existentially threatened um, situations can be thrown to believe more in conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories is, of course, just one, can be one aspect of misinformation. Rob Brotherton um, actually also wrote a book recently um, on why we fall for fake news, which I can also recommend. It's a light introduction to the topic, also delves into the history of how news became the news that they are today, based, like, starting from, like, a very, very slow environment where, where we had to wait for information for weeks, to travel, for example, over the Atlantic or to arrive up until today, where we basically have news in real time, where it's actually difficult to, to not receive any news, where we barely can even choose to consume news, where basically um, news are just there and we have to consume them also, almost. What we did in a prior study, um, which was focused on COVID-19 misinformation, but, but was in, which insights can also be to some extent expanded to misinformation more generally, for example, misinformation related to climate change, is that we more or less um, categorized the specific psychological or behavioral variables that can explain why belief, why people believe in misinformation or why people share misinformation. And we basically used all the um, literature that came out in 2020, 2021 on COVID-19 misinformation and that investigated why or which people were more prone to believe or share misinformation. We categorized all these factors. So things very basic like people's age, people's um, gender, people's um, educational background, how these factors affected belief or sharing of misinformation, their personality, um, their general beliefs, cognitive factors, so their likelihood of reflection, so reflecting before sharing something or some people share something more intuitively, so they don't think a lot about um, the content of information before they share something. Social aspects, so how um, embedded people are in a social network, how um, their perceptions and emotions are, so if people are more emotional, or also their political um, aspects of people tend to be more associated with the right or the left wing of the political spectrum. So this is how we approach this um, this particular aspect of COVID-19 misinformation here. And we found a lot of um, correlation also to misinformation in general. So there's a lot of um, literature already um, that shows that people who are tend to be more reflective in decision-making are less likely to believe and share misinformation. People who are more on the right tend to be more likely to share misinformation, especially if this misinformation relates to political um, topics. But of course, these variables don't really explain why people misinformation. They allow us to identify um, certain groups of people who are more prone to be receptive to misinformation, but they don't necessarily explain the reason why people share misinformation. And to delve a bit deeper into the, the potential reasons, I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to participate, wanted you to participate in a Slido um, survey that I have prepared here. Um, there should be a link in the chat now. You can also scan this QR code. You can also go on slido.com and type in the hashtag EGU. It would be great if we can do that right now. At the same time, I have to 
start the survey. So maybe while you are joining, it would be great to have a look at just one question. It would be great if you can just, uh, um, I give you maybe one minute, one and a half minutes to um, indicate what you think is the reason that, or the main reason for people to share misinformation. Okay, I see the first answers getting in. I'm not showing them yet so that you're not um, affected by um, other people's responses. Just checking how many people are in this. Okay, we have 29 people, so I'll already 13 responses. It's already looking interesting for me because maybe as a background to be asked this, I asked this question also, I think, okay, by now a year ago in a talk that I gave at the European Commission and it looks relatively similar to the responses I saw then. Okay, already almost everyone responded. Okay, so I will show the results now and as I can see, or as you can see here as well, the main answer that you have been giving is that they are convinced. So they share things that align with their opinions and they basically don't really care if, it, if it's true or false information that they're sharing. Close, well, not close, but second is that inattentiveness. So the account that people have um, other priorities that's more likely to, to get a reaction from people or to get likes, for example, on, on Twitter or on Facebook, for example, and only 4% of you think that it's um, a result of being confused. So that people think they are sharing something which is true, but that they are actually sharing something false. Now, back to the presentation. So there's actually, um, this is basically um, a question related to a paper by Gordon Pennycook and colleagues where they also, uh, um, they do an experiment actually to find out what the main reasons are. They basically have the way they design this experiment allows them to differentiate. So they're not just asking people what they think is the reason, but they are setting up an experiment that allows them to differentiate between the three, the three different accounts. And actually what they find is that the account that you all indicated to be the most prominent, the preference account, so they don't care if it is, if it is false, they want to share misinformation is actually the, the reason that is found by Penny Cook and colleagues to be the least um, prominent reason why people share misinformation. They say that, or they find that 33, so a third of people, they think it is true, but it's actually false, so they are confused. And or almost half of the participants, they are, share something because they're inattentive to the um, falsity or the, the, the veracity of the information. So they are, um, they care more for likes, they, they don't really pay attention to um, the veracity. Doesn't mean that this is to be always the case. This is one study. Um, I wouldn't take this for like 100% that this is always the case, but it's still, I think, interesting to see that we sometimes assume um, people share um, misinformation for, because of their preferences, which is of course the case and which can, given certain con um, context, given certain misinformation narratives, um, very much be the case and these percentages can then be very, very uh, relatively higher, of course, but at least in the study by Penny Cook, which was published in Nature, um, the distribution was differently. So this is also important when we think about how what to do about misinformation, right? Because we need to take into account that um, people have um, varying reasons for why we share misinformation of which inattentiveness or confusion are to, um, in order to select the best interventions to fight misinformation, we can draw here from a set of different types of interventions, pre-banking on the left-hand side, which can help um, at, at, this, at a time and in, in place and space where um, people are not yet exposed to misinformation. So before people see misinformation, they can be informed about the threat, that they can afford, be informed about the, the strategies that, that uh, misinformation is using, um, to, up to the right hand side, um, just plain debunking, so setting the record straight, basically. In our experiment, we focus on pre-bunking and debunking. And explicitly, what we wanted to find out is if the European Commission, which is one actor that is debunking or pre-bunking, right, that has to deal with misinformation, if they can safely debunk and pre-bunk, also for people who don't even trust the European Union. So 
people who don't trust the institution that is telling them this is misinformation or be careful misinformation might be incoming so pre-banking and what we did so we basically we ran an experiment an online experiment in four countries of the european union um october 2022 and we showed people um three different types of climate change related misinformation three different articles related to COVID 19 that were misinformation and some of them were pre-bunked so they got a, an explanation of what common strategies are used by misinformation articles others are debunked after they encounter misinformation basically telling them these are the strategies and this is wrong and this is right so we asked people um what do you think about the different types of misinformation that you see and you can see here um, there is some agreement with the claims so related to climate change was for example um, that the climate models are very very unreliable or that there is no scientific conf uh, there is no scientific consensus on, on climate change you see roughly a quarter of the participants agree at least to one of these claims at least a bit or um, so they agree or very much agree there is some intention to endorse these articles, so to share these articles to tell them this is correct. There is a bit more, um, I can actually use the pointer, um, willingness to disagree, so also to public, to share an article in order to say this is false information. And roughly a quarter um, find any on any dimension that we asked about this, uh, this article completely incredible, but also meaning on the other hand that three quarters uh, more or less find at least some credibility in these articles that we're showing them so what we want to, to find out now um, how well do our debunks and pre-bunks work and either the neutral debunk which has no information on who is responsible for debunking and the debunks that are coming from the european commission and these a b c d these are the different outcome variables that we test basically what we see here the debunks and pre-bunks they all work in reducing the agreement with the main claim. They are also quite um, effective in reducing the, the people's assessments of the credibility. They are mostly also effective in reducing their intentions to share an article to agree with it. Although we can already see it's, it's a bit less prominent here, for example, for the pre-bank from the European Commission. And it's more challenging to actually increase people's likelihood to share the article to denounce it to disagree with in order to maybe to warn others about it um, what you can also see here is the more people are trusting of the european union the less likely they are to agree with the misinformation the less likely are they they are to find it credible etc to share it um, um, for um, to, to agree with it but they are more likely to um, disagree with it this is for all misinformation that we're looking at so aggregated over um, climate change and COVID misinformation we have i have this here it's a bit um, less legible unfortunately also broken down by the type so climate change or COVID. for these two outcome variables it's mostly the same for here we can see that climate change seems to be climate change misinformation seems to be a bit less receptive to debunks and pre-bunks we don't know um exactly why that is the case um, there appears to be no like floor effect that there is just less people that believe in it in the first place so there's less that these debunks and prebunks can accomplish that appears not to be the case so those people who are believe in climate change misinformation seem to be more resistant to um, these um, interventions that we show them what we see here was the original aim of the of the study to find out if the debunks that are coming from the european commission are more effective for people that are um, very, very trusting in the European Commission. The, the, those are the people here on the right hand side of this graph. And here, the people who are um, less than average um, trusting in the European Union. Basically, what we see overall is that there is, contrary to our expectations, there, there is, appears to be no big um, interaction effect. So mostly the European Commission can actually debunk, pre-bunk, irrespective of the recipients trust in the European Union, which is good news, contrary to what we predicted. There are some qualifications to the statements, but that's our main takeaway from this. So and this is also leads me to the summary. So um, our approach is it's important to understand why people believe in misinformation or share misinformation in order to fight it effectively. 
um, identifying the profiles as we did in the report is not equal to understanding the costs per se, but it might still be relevant if you want to, for example, target specific profiles of or segments of consumers in order to protect them because they need the protection. Pre-bumps and debunks work, um, but there might be a harder challenge for climate change related misinformation. They work also when they come from the European Commission. Pre-bumps mostly work irrespective of people's trust in the EU. There are some qualifications that I just said for pre-bunks, um, but mostly it works irrespective of people's trust in the European Union. And sorry, debunks can be less effective for people with low trust in the EU and more effective for people with high trust in the EU. It was the, the last figure that I showed you where there were some interaction, but this was really just for one or two of the four outcome variables. So it's not a consistent pattern. That's it from my side. Um, just if you want something practical, so tips on countering conspiracy theories and misinformation, there is a lot out there. I can also give you more literature if you want, but this is just a very like a one piece, a one sheet that we came up with I think at the beginning of the COVID crisis with very, very, um, um, except for researchers um, that you can scan here if you're interested or I can share that in the chat as well. Thank you, Hendrik. Maybe you could uh, share that in the chat for people. Yep. So I can. Then yep. we'll move on to our uh, second speaker, uh, Guy. Guy, if you'd like to start sharing and begin your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, first, Hendrik, for your uh, fascinating introduction into what is misinformation and why we have to uh, address it. Um, in my presentation, what I'm going to, to do is to take it directly into the situation of the nature restoration law uh, and our role in this case as scientists in trying to debunk uh, misinformation. Um, and this is uh, based on the situation that uh, occurred during the last summer and currently with the trial of negotiations. Um, I want to start actually my presentation with acknowledging the fact that I'm not working alone, I'm not working in a vacuum, uh, but rather uh, within a context of many projects that I'm involved in and with many uh, other people and projects, uh, the ICABES, uh, which is a project from uh, IDIV, an integration project uh, within uh, WebZet and several projects where we try to understand, uh, especially the, the topic of agricultural sustainability and trying to help, help farmers uh, in uh, improving um, the functioning for especially agricultural systems. I'm personally a conservation biologist. Actually, one of my expertise is butterflies. Um, but I realized long ago already that in order to achieve uh, nature protection, nature restoration aims, we have to work with people and uh, with systems. And that's how I uh, started working on the common agricultural policy as one of the main topics that I'm working on. Um, but again, to put a bigger context beyond the people and, and projects that we're working on, let's put everything in the context of what is currently happening in the world. We are living in a period of multiple crises. We have climate change, uh, happening very fast, particularly now. Um, we have biodiversity losses and they're accelerating, they're worsening. Uh, the pressures on ecosystems are, are worsening. Uh, and this includes also pressure on ecosystem services. We are losing pollinators, uh, pest controllers, soil erosion and degradation, land degradation are severe problems. And these also are influencing uh, water. They're influencing food. Uh, and therefore we are seeing uh, food crisis, which I would still not say food security in this uh, broader form, but many people are experiencing this. We have health crisis, which is um, shown not only by COVID, but many other type of diseases, uh, including also mental diseases. Uh, we also have other crises, which we shouldn't forget. So our system is affected also by the human um, anthropogenic environment we are, we are, that we are living in. Inequity and inequality are our major crisis at the moment. Democratic backsliding, meaning that we are losing on democracies, um, and also uh, what we call a financial systems crisis, where financial systems are collapsing, partly because we are uh, utilizing Earth resources to a level which, in which uh, Earth cannot support us. And climate change is only one out of the many crises we are experiencing, although it's probably the one that we are hearing most often in the news. And we have already heard from Hendrik how severe problem of misinformation and disinformation is in the context of climate. But what I want to come in, in is into the, the question of what do we do with all that? How do we address uh, this crisis? Um, and here we need to realize how urgent it is to take an action. Uh, here in the graphic uh, produced by the World in Data, there are 
trying to estimate how fast will we need to change given that every year we're delaying our action, our political action. And if you look at such a graph, or at least at me as, a, as, a, as an expert in the field, when I see such a graph, I get really stressed because this graph means by now we, we are going towards a complete collapse of the system. Either the system will bring us to collapse or we have to step down our mission so fast that things have to change dramatically and immediately. And this also applies uh, to biodiversity and biodiversity losses, which are occurring very fast. We are still seeing not only deforestation, but even accelerating deforestation. We are still losing habitats in Europe. Um, and the main question is, why is it that we don't see policy taking a serious uh, response to these crises? So something is going wrong with our poli policies. And, and then now we have to put it in the context of science versus the rest of the world. As a scientist, I have to uh, accept the fact that I'm paid by uh, public uh, money. I'm doing my work. I'm a single person. Many of my colleagues are persons as well. We are not stakeholders. We are not holding a stake. We are trying to help society. We are trying to understand the world. And uh, of course, as a conservation biologist, we are extremely concerned for good reasons because we are well informed about the severity of the crisis. But when we're trying to inform uh, politicians, we cannot anticipate that they will take our recommendations because they have many others that will shout with different voices and eventually they have to take decisions that will affect the voters. And the voters' will is the starting point, but in between the votes that happen once in four years or five years in a democratic situation, in a stable democratic situation, um, there are also a lot of different lobby processes and pressures, uh, particularly there are papers showing already from the 90s and even 80s that small and homogeneous lobbies have a lot more impact than large, even consensus groups that are very heterogeneous. They can press a lot more effectively uh, towards a political pressure, towards achieving their goals, and eventually a change of political structure or inaction, which is not just inaction, it's resistance to changes. So it's not just that politicians don't do something, they resist very actively. And soon I'll demonstrate how they do that and why. And in this, we have to ask, why is it not that only policies are failing, but politicians are not serving uh, the aims that we think that they should be doing? And that's partly because if there are 25,000 lobbyists as a conservative, uh, conservative estimation in Brussels alone, if the investments are about 3 billion a year, we're talking about 33 lobbyists to each person in the European Parliament. So what is happening with European politics is that we have what you call the Brussels bubble, uh, where lobbies are actually funding governance, are affecting governance, they're part of the governance in some cases. Um, and many of the parliament members, for instance, are acting to a certain extent independently of what voters might think that they're doing. And this is where we come into the arena of mis misinformation. And it is being used actually as a tool, as an instrument uh, for many actors group in, in this is case, we're talking about disinformation uh, by generating confusion. Uh, we know that there's an interest in bringing scientific uncertainty to climate change uh, and to create misunderstanding or confusion among, among the public. There's a very good paper demonstrating uh, the strength of what you call pluralistic ignorance, meaning that most people think differently than what they should be thinking, or they even think that they are in a minority, whereas they're actually in the majority. So a, a recent paper from the US has demonstrated that most people are concerned about climate change, but they are thinking that they're actually in minority in thinking this way, meaning they think that they're actually isolated and operating alone, whereas actually the majority of the population is in fact uh, worried about climate change. So misinformation is actually an instrument in uh, driving some decision making, and it's it's weakening science, it's weakening evidence. Uh, you can spread it around in order to polarize debates, and we are seeing that if you speak to farmers, they usually are not against the environment, they're not anti-environment. Uh, and nevertheless, what you're hearing in the context of nature restoration or uh, agriculture, you usually hear is if farmers are anti-environment, and that's actually not the reality. And this is leading to polarization in society. It leads also farmers to feeling that they're alone, uh, and isolated from the rest of society. And then, of course, they will go and vote to certain political parties or will feel that they are represented by those uh, that actually are misrepresenting them. And this leads also to, to biased decision making. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, how this is happening in the reality of the nature restoration law, which many of us uh, as scientists 
were uh, really astonished about uh, the strength of resistance during the last summer. So what happened was that the European Commission, as part of the Green Deal, released uh, an instrument which is complementing other European policies. We already had the bird directives, we had the habitats directives, the water framework directives, and of course we had also the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policies, and we still are not managing um, to stop biodiversity losses even in Europe. And the European Commission published the nature restoration law as a means uh, to address policy failures until now. In summer this year, uh, there were huge number of claims against the nature restoration law that were raised by uh, some opponents uh, of this legislation piece. Uh, and many of the claims when I was observing them and many of my uh, colleagues were observing them, were, we were really like looking at that and saying, what is going on here? How comes that people are claiming things which are so wrong? Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the various claims that were pro put, but we, we saw a major attack uh, prior to the um, decision that were uh, supposed to be taken by the parliament. So we heard claims like uh, that the nature restoration law, as well as the sustainable use regulation, which was published as well, would reduce yield, uh, would you reduce production and consequently can risk uh, food security, that it will take away jobs, that it will place a burden of society that we cannot um, maintain or we cannot take this, this burden, especially in the times of war. Um, we heard that it will prevent Europe from feeding the world and that it will force farmers to abandon 10% of agricultural land. All the lists you're seeing here are basically misinformation. And what I'm going to do in the coming minutes is to uh, demonstrate what we did with this information and how we addressed it. So after talking to various stakeholders, we realized that the strength of attack on the nature restoration may lead to a complete uh, rejection of this law at the parliament and will completely stop uh, a much needed legislation. Together with 24 authors uh, and later on with 6,000 signatures, um, so scientists, we checked of course that these are scientists, uh, have been signing a call for the European Union uh, to be ambitious, to take this legislation onwards, to take the evidence, to use the science um, and to continue with the nature restoration law. And you could see that we had signatures from all over uh, the uh, European Union, including also uh, countries beyond that. We did not invite scientists outside, but we did not say no. Most of these were environmental scientists, but we need to remember that science, science even about uh, topics like the nature restoration law, also includes political sciences and social sciences, economists. Um, so we had a lot of different um, scientists that signed this. And in the coming minutes, I'm going to give you some examples of what these people have been signing? What have we said uh, in response to these claims? So we took them one after the other and we debunked them systematically uh, using the science, using what we know uh, that is the science behind. So let's take some examples. First of all, the claim that the nature restoration law and the sustainable use regulation will risk food security. And of course, we have to start with the reality, something that everybody feels and understands. So in this, uh, in this sense, it is the truth that if you take out land from production at any scale you're talking about, then you produce less. And if you produce less, then of course, you will have less production almost tautologically. Um, but is this really a risk to food security? So if you upscale this question of production losses, you need to ask what are actually the real reasons of food security? What are the real problems? So first of all, nature restoration usually takes place in places that are less productive. So production reductions are likely marginal and you can actually uh, avoid them by uh, certain agricultural production methods. Secondly, the real risk to food security are coming from environmental collapse, climate change, loss of biodiversity, uh, pollination, soil degradation, etc. And if you want to stop these, you want to restore nature because you need to stop soil uh, degradation by putting trees or structures. And so the reality shown by science is we are actually talking about nature protection as a means to secure production, to secure um, uh, future food. And so it makes no sense to even claim that by protection of nature, you will risk food security. If anything, you will achieve resilience of uh, agricultural production. A second, a second example is this question of burden on society. We have to ask what is exactly society here? This is complete misinformation because society is not just farmers and not even just the minority of farmers that might be affected negatively, whereas many farmers actually might be affected positively in the example of agriculture. It's correct for also fisheries. So some might lose their job. 
some might need to produce less, but is that a burden on society? So if you're looking now at agriculture as an example, and of course there are also fisheries or others, then society is actually currently paying twice, if not three times. We are paying by subsidies to farmers, 55 billion a year in the EU, and we are bearing the costs of unsustainable farmers farming by climate change, by diversity declines, uh, by pesticide overuse, nitrogen and pollution uh, leaking into, leaching into water systems. We are experiencing water scarcity and quality, and it includes also health effects. So we need to pay the health consequences and of course, the lack of access to natural environments um, also for our mental health. So the nature restoration law was accompanied by an impact assessment demonstrating that even if you look just at the monetary aspects, just at the money aspect, then the benefits to costs are estimated 12 to one. And so in this case, we are talking about the cost efficient investment into insurance for health, well-being, farm resilience and food security. So if we go beyond just monetary benefits, it's clear that we're not talking about the burden to society, but rather an investment in insurance. Another claim that I want to debunk here is this claim that farmers will have to abandon 10% land because of the nature restoration law, which is interesting because, yes, you might want uh, to take some land out of production, for instance, for the purpose of rewetting or restoring or re uh, uh, rewilding some areas, especially if these areas are not productive or this is creating health or climate effects. But factually, the nature restoration law never claims that we need to take 10% uh, out of production. And in fact, the 10% target is already included somewhere else, which is the common agricultural policy, uh, without going into details here. Even conceptually, this is misinformation because if you're using the word abandonment, you're actually talking to, about a process where farmer is abandoning the land, which usually is taking place at the farm level. And usually this happens in remote areas where farmers don't have enough support from the common agricultural policy, and consequently they are not economically viable. So the problem is inequity and inefficiency of CAP payments um, and the 55 billions that we are not spending efficiently. So the nature restoration law in this sense is actually the means to address the deficiencies in current policies, especially um, the CAP. And one of the claims that were always brought up is that if you ask farmers uh, to stop producing or fisheries to stop in a certain area, you need to compensate these people. And so it makes no sense to claim that you will abandon the land without making sure that you will compensate these people for these losses, which is what the nature restoration law could be doing. So um, to start the wrapping up of, of this story, I gave some examples out of the many. This is published in an open letter, uh, which was published uh, on Zenodo and as well on, on the Society for Conservation Biology Europe section uh, website. So you can read that with the answers to eight uh, different arguments, also in the marine environment. Um, and we had 6,000 signatures, and we had many of these that were acting as multiplicators. They created a lot of media attention. Um, we spoke to policymakers, to NGOs. We delivered um, the uh, arguments, and it seems that it had the impact of many people changing their opinions, uh, resulting in, at least we were not the only ones, but we delivered uh, uh, the pressure, which eventually led to a majority vote, uh, 336 against 300, so the vote has passed, which sounds like a success. But in fact, two things should be watched. One is that 51% majority compared to 96% societal support that we need nature restoration uh, is not a great success in my opinion, given that they have both societal and scientific support. So there's a gap between policymaking and our society. And the second thing is that many amendments were taken into the proposal during the voting, uh, not only by the parliament, but also by the council. Currently, the trilogue negotiations are going on. And when we are examining the list of amendments uh, that were put into the nature restoration law, one can see that there was a destructive attempt to weaken, uh, to weaken the, the nature restoration law significantly by weakening the targets in articles four and five, by completely deleting agriculture. Uh, farmland was completely deleted in article nine. The entire article nine was deleted. But also they added an amendment uh, saying that the common agricultural policy and the common fisheries policies cannot be used as source of funding, which is kind of shooting your own foot because this is one of the easiest policies to tweak if you want to support the nature restoration law. And of course, I will not go into the details of how many loopholes were introduced so that member states wouldn't need to do anything, um, including one 
uh, in Article 23, which will basically allow never to uh, for this uh, legislation to come into action at all, uh, unless they address issues of food security, which actually are based on misinformation. So what we observed is that there is very low ambition among the parliament, but also among many of the ministers, including ministers of the environment, uh, showing very low ambition, uh, which is really a shame given that it's very clear how much you can benefit from such a legislation. So I think in this sense, each of us can do something about that because not only scientists, but in society, we have a unique power in understanding where information and evidence can be used to help people uh, bodies, organizations that are interested to know better or to take a more informed decision. This, of course, means that we need to identify misinformation and be able to debunk it. So in this sense, our letter is, for instance, an instrument that could be used uh, when you want to address uh, claims which might be false or misunderstood. But this also requires us to understand the difference between complexity, which is there, uncertainty, which is there, and the lack of solutions. We do have solutions if we want to, and this requires a political and societal will. So in this, um, I could simply welcome everybody who thinks that they have this knowledge and understand it uh, to foster such science policy or so science societal interactions where you think that we can improve the way our society responds to the current crisis. Um, with this, I'd like to thank you for attention and invite a discussion. Thank you so much, Guy. Um, with that, we'll begin our discussion. Um, just before we get into sort of the other deeper questions, I was wondering if Hendrik could just give it a very quick um, definition of debunking and pre-bunking. Um, yeah, I also already responded to one question regarding pre-bunking. Um, so debunking, I think, is quite straightforward because it's basically just setting the record straight. So. Um, um, basically saying this is wrong information, this is correct information. There is actually a more or less scientifically um, proven way to do it in the best way. So in order to not make the, the misinformation too prominent, because there was in the past a fear that if you, um, if you based on scientific evidence that didn't fully hold up, that if you repeat the misinformation, that it might actually backfire, that it might actually get people to believe more in the misinformation afterwards. So there is basically the best way of first starting with the truth then just repeating the false claim very briefly, the most important aspects, then explaining why it is false and providing background and finishing with the true information so that you give just the minimum necessary room to the misinformation that it needs. Because it might always happen that if you, if you repeat the misinformation, it might actually, um, if people didn't even know about this misinformation claim, they might be introduced to it via the debunk. So in order to just um, make this very, very um, likely that people don't um, pick up the false narrative. And pre-bunking is, so there are different, it's a wide um, concept, there are different types of pre-bunks, but basically um, pre-bunking happens before people encounter a certain misinformation narrative. So it's independent of a narrative, um, and basically just educating people how to spot misinformation, what do you have to look out in order to get a sense of is, is this reliable, is this not reliable, so have a look, um, look out for the um, strategies that are being used, so claiming this is proof that this is from these experts who are um, super great are um, telling you that this is correct, so there are certain strategies that are not always easy to spot, but um, this is important, an important ingredient to pre-bunking. And there is a specific type of pre-bunking, which is actually quite interesting because it draws on the analogy of inoculations or vaccination, basically. And they refer to it as uh, cognitive inoculation, where people basically are exposed to a, a reduced dose of misinformation. And they're also made aware that uh, misinformation is there. So you're exposed to the threat, like a real misinformation. Then they're given... The, the necessary ingredients in order to defend themselves, um, to build cognitive antibodies basically against misinformation. And this is often being done in um, actually in, in game environments. So there's a sp specific game in the internet, like, uh, um, how's it called? Go viral is one game or bad news. Um, basically you are actually in this game, taking the perspective of someone who's spreading misinformation and via this, you get a sense of, okay, this is disinformation. This is what the negative effects are. 
And but via this, you, you generate the antibodies that help you then later to, to spot misinformation and to protect yourself against misinformation. And, and this is a very, there's a lot of research now occurring, but it's a relatively young concept. But so far, the evidence mostly shows that there is, there is short-term effectiveness and also to a certain extent, long-term effectiveness um, that people get um, protected against misinformation. But certainly it's not a panacea, of course, it's just one strategy of, of, of many. Thanks, thanks for that. I just want to perhaps take a bit step here, a more of a step into the conversation now um, and just ask, um, building what Guy finished on and also one of the questions uh, we've received from the guests um, is what is the role of scientists in approaching misinformation um, and what limits are there? Um, misinformation is produced quickly and spreads quickly, um, and even policy making, policymakers uh, want solutions, whilst scientists tend to move slowly with research to understand uncertainties, um, and even debunking takes time. Uh, so how should scientists appreciate the role here, and can scientists operate alone? Perhaps there's uh, routes for collaboration. Um, if you could, this, perhaps Guy, could you start on that side? Yes, thank you for this question. Actually, there are quite a few questions which were asked at the same time, so I'll try to answer several uh, questions here. The first question is, what is the role of science uh, when we're talking about misinformation? And the example of the nature restoration law is a situation for, which for me was relatively clear because this is misinformation within my field, meaning I have the mandate as a knowledge producer to use the knowledge which I've produced through 20 years of research uh, in debunking information. So when I see that misinformation is being spread or disinformation is being spread actively in this case, um, I have the mandate to respond because this is my knowledge. Meaning, um, if I know that this is wrong, I think I have the right to do so. And personally, and this is a personal decision, I think I have also the responsibility to do that because I'm being paid by uh, public money uh, to produce this knowledge. But I also feel, and this is a feeling question, that um, we might be wasting money and time uh, investing so much money into projects that produce knowledge which is then ignored. So in this sense, of course, we are persons and we have to take our decisions as people, as concerned citizens, but also very well-informed ones. And this is where things become blurred of whether this is an opinion of a person or the opinion of an institution. In this case, I've taken the decision of taking an action as a person. In other cases, uh, we've been dec uh, taking decisions as institutions, um, but still the issue is to stay on their comfort zone. At the moment I step out of my comfort zone and step into opinions which are not based on my knowledge, I step into being a citizen. And that's where uh, 24 authors had to cooperate in debunking misinformation. I'm not a marine scientist. And in, in fact, when we started writing uh, the response to the claims against the marine um, protection areas, I had to involve people who had the expertise on that. And even some of the claims that I wrote were, were false because I, I thought that marine uh, protected areas in, can boost uh, marine um, fisheries, for instance. But in fact, the situation is a bit more complex and you have to make sure as scientists that you also reflect, I wouldn't call it diversity of opinion, but the variance which exists in reality. If we, if we fail to reflect uncertainties and variances we are in the risk of becoming politicians or lobbyists. And this is something we are not. In this sense, of course, I lobby for nature. In this sense, policymakers perceive me as a, as a lobbyist. And I think this is not a problem because from policy perspective, this is completely okay. But as a scientist, I don't perceive myself as a lobbyist, but as representing the laws of nature because nature does not compromise. So political texts can be compromised, but natural laws cannot, will not compromise with us. So my job here is to represent Mother Nature, to represent biodiversity and ecosystem services, and make sure that policymakers are aware of their responsibility to take the inputs from science. And if they fail to do that, that's their responsibility. And I feel that it's correct and necessary to put the facts on the table and say, well, you've spread this information. You should be aware that this is wrong. Now you can do whatever, you can continue spreading that, but be aware, I'm not going to bash anybody, that's not my job, 
but this is misinformation. And if they are aware they still continue the same, then something went wrong. But I think nobody else can do a better job in debunking informa misinformation than those that have the evidence on the table. I have to still answer the one question which is very important about the speed of operation. That was one of the, the most stressful situations for me to produce the document that we produced. We, we actually managed to do that in about 10 days. That was a lot of work and very little sleep for many people. Um, but this is indeed the difference between producing new knowledge, such as we need to monitor what is happening in reality, we need to learn about the complexities and resolve them, versus knowledge synthesis. This is what also IDIV, the center where I'm working on and do set are doing, which is to integrate the existing knowledge, to process it and to deliver it onward. In this case, since the knowledge is so well established, it didn't take us too much time because we know uh, what is the background. And we also knew that the misinformation comes from certain areas. So we had all the material ready from previous uh, presentations, uh, publications, etc. So here the task is knowledge synthesis in this sense and not knowledge production. So this is important. Thank you. So part of that really is building networks and collaborations, um, not just to react to the moment, but like preparing for this in a way, in a, um, a way to have the knowledge ready to go off cost as can acknowledge having it and communicating it. But uh, building networks uh, seems to be like a key aspect of that. Um, can I add a small, a small point to that? Just of course. To, just to to support Guy, what he's saying there, because um, that's actually a very important point. And also, it's very very difficult for one, like for an individual scientist, to um, to debunk everything that's going on, um, because there is even like fact checkers in the in the internet that have trouble to to keep pace with all the misinformation narratives that are being. Um, put on the internet daily. I've been um, to a Google event last week um, on fighting misinformation online. There's a whole industry revolving a, around that, it, that whose goal it is just to fight misinformation since 2016. So it's very, very young. There is so much need there and still they are being overwhelmed by everything that's going on, not just by the quantity, but also, of course, the lack of financial financing that they that they have to deal with, right? Because it's they, they are often doing this because they're intrinsically motivated, because they think it's a responsibility. And I think for scientists, if possible, and that also relates to this one point by um, Letizia Santos de Lima on what, what about topics that where there is no scientific context, uh, con consensus, that makes it extra difficult because I think, and I can share two papers related to that, um, it's important, if possible, for scientists to not engage as individuals, but as groups, that even if there is no 100% consensus, which is rarely the case, to outline uh, or to speak as a collective in order to evade this false consensus effect. Because we often have these situations, it's the, the basic example is we have one person on a scientific show, um, on, a, on a network show where that is pro-environment, that's uh, climate change, and he has to dis debate with one climate contrarian, even though the the one researcher stands for 98% or 99% or 100% of researchers and the other for a, for a minuscule percentage in order to evade these situations because the public is sensitive to this. If they see one researcher arguing, they're asking themselves, is it just one person? Do they, does he speak or she speak for the whole field? So if possible, and there are also nowadays, luckily, um, technological help in order to find consensus um, or to visualize consensus, to visualize uncertainty in groups of scientists, for example. I think that's very important point. Yes. I'm sharing the two links and can share them in the chat if you want. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just building on that point of you need to uh, find collaborators, you need to build on networks um, with other scientists, potentially beyond that as well. A few of the questions were touching upon perhaps more personal perspectives uh, or reactions to engaging with this um, very fast moving political and um, scientific or policy sphere. Um, asking perhaps, um, well, fears of perhaps being uh, seen as a, a activist perhaps, um, and how that might curtail your um, engagement with a topic. Um, but also how your engagement with the topic, um, there's a lot of people there who, um, dispute information information, should it be worthwhile going towards them and dealing with them, or should scientists also try and get other collaborators to come in as well? Um, because, I mean, as a scientist, you might want to try and 
like maintain that idea of impartiality. But as Guy says, you've got a science size and business inside, but it's too right, difficult to keep them separate. Um, I suppose the key question from there is, um, you want to engage in misinformation, but is there a limit you find from your personal experience of how much you can do, or do you just disregard it to a degree and um, engage as to, to your best of your ability? So, um, yeah, I also see that indeed somebody was asking whether I fear, for instance, um, being labeled a, an activist. And um, this is a fear that I had until uh, some years ago when I, I was really astonished about the amount of positive response um, to going outside and pol to talking to policymakers, calling them for action. And one thing that was really important for me and, and many colleagues that are happily cooperating with us, it's not just with me, but with, with a network of people, is that we don't tell politicians what they should do. They should do their politics, um, but we offer help. So we, we do not, I wouldn't say ever, but we are trying to avoid situations where we don't meet somebody. So uh, we did meet people from any uh, aspects of the, of the political range, including the leaders uh, or some of the leaders that were willing to meet us uh, of the uh, attack on the nature restoration law. And um, some members of the EPP did meet us and um, and we were really astonished about the fact that that they have taken the, the efforts to talk to us and, and we simply ask, okay, what are your concerns and how can we help you? So we know and you know that it's misinformation. And in fact, we were really surprised that they actually apologized and said, well, in fact, uh, we do think that the company that is doing this campaign has gone a bit too far in simply lying, inventing stuff. Um, and they acknowledged the fact that, um, of course, uh, that's what they say when they talk, talk to us, but at least they acknowledge the fact um, that they went too far. And two hours later, their campaign actually changed, uh, which was a lot more difficult because it was, of course, much more sophisticated and new, claim, uh, new claims came in, which were even more false. Um, however, we did see some reflection on, on, the, on the topic. So I think, first of all, I would like to encourage anybody who thinks that uh, being an activist is a bad word. I think being active and being proactive is important because I don't think it makes more sense to let NGOs speak for our scientists. Rather, I prefer to speak for my own science and stand for it because this is then science communication. Whereas if we deliver that to NGOs, environmental NGOs or farmers, I mean, they are already having a certain opinion. And so the, the assumption is that they will deliver only what they want to deliver rather than the, the fine-tuned understanding of, of science. So I think at least my experience personally was an incredible support from the scientific community. I mean, I was criticized once in a while, but I got a lot more positive responses. Um, and of course, I made sure that I continue being a scientist because otherwise I can produce further knowledge. So it's important to find a balance because science policy does take a lot of time and energy as well. Great. Thank you, Guy. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. It's quite a short word for all, unfortunately. However, um, I want to give uh, both our panelists one quick uh, final point to make. Um, and this is more about practically how should people engage? If you have one opinion in terms of how people should engage with uh, misinformation, specifically, specifically science misinformation at the science policy sphere, how should they uh, go about that? How should they engage with that process? Um, Hendrik, if you'd like to start with that. Um, I, I think just basically before engaging, thinking about what might be the possible reason of of the misinformation that has been shared. Of course, in the end, it's guessing because you don't know about the other sites, persons, institutions, intentions. But just to take this into account that there are different reasons of why people share misinformation, that it's often unclear why they share misinformation, and then based on what you think is the main, what, what is the potential reason look for a best response um, and try to act not too direct, not too um, um, yeah, offensive, for lack of a better word, a bit more understanding in order to engage in constructive rather than um, rather than discussion that is directly cut off by the other side in the world. And Guy, if you could have your point as well. Yeah, I would make two points. Um, one is that uh, we are working with people. 
And although those that usually spread or produce misinformation or disinformation are doing that deliberately uh, for some purposes, most people that share this misinformation are not aware of that. And being better informed and trying to understand what is the logic behind the misunderstanding from their side and being empathetic with that is a starting point where you could actually bend the curve of their understanding of, of, of what is going wrong. Because if you don't understand why they do that from the first place, you will not be able to help them out of this uh, misconception, I would say. The second thing is not to work alone because it, the, the amount of fatigue you can experience um, is, is very, very rapidly overwhelming. And so you need to work together with others and, and share the efforts and understand that each of us can do something and all of us should stay on our comfort zone and our contribution to that uh, makes makes a difference. Just like in democracy, everybody that is going to vote believes that their vote has a meaning. And so if we vote for the better, then it means that we find our own way of contributing to do better. Um, and uh, addressing misinformation, I think, is really, really central towards changing uh, and, and helping the transformations that need to happen fast. Thank you. Right. Thank you both. So a few key takeaways would be, of course, be critical of what you consume in the media, and of course, provide information but when you uh, engage with people to be empathetic and understanding of what positioning, um, and also when you do engage with people and engage in what political, political processes, uh, find your people, find your communities, and build it collaboratively and don't work alone. Um, unfortunately, I have to close the webinar uh, now. I want to say thank you once again to our panelists, Hendrik and Guy. Thank you for our audience for attending uh, this webinar recording will be uploaded onto the EG YouTube channel in uh, one week uh, from some of the time of recording. So if you want to watch again, please check it out there. Otherwise, that's goodbye to me and have a great day. <laughs>